Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Researching Mariner Ancestors in New England. My name is Ginevra Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's program. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide research resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I do want to note that we are broadcasting from our homes to your home with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end and we thank you for your patience. Uh, even if we were to lose connection, not to worry, you will still have access to a full recording of the session on our website site as well as our YouTube channel. Giving today's presentation is a native New Englander and second generation American Susan Donnelly, a genealogist here at American Ancestors with our Newbury Street Press. She spent uh, two years with the American Ancestors Research Services team working on several large projects before joining Newbury Street Press. Prior to working at American Ancestors, Susan was the director and auction coordinator with a premier antique gallery in Boston for two decades and an archival volunteer with the Hingham Historical Society. She received her BA in English Literature from uh, Simmons College and holds a professional certificate in genealogy from Boston University. Her research interests include colonial America, royal ancestry, westward expansion, and U.S. migration trails. So for many living in New England during the 17th through the 20th centuries, their livelihood and even survival was inextricably linked to the sea. So in today's webinar, uh, Susan will provide a brief history of mariners in New England, discuss some major ports and sources of, of industry, especially fishing, shipbuilding, whaling, trade, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, and merchant marines. I will say uh, at, the, at the start that this is a very broad topic. Um, and we could probably fill many, many webinars, many courses just on uh, researching marine ancestry. So this is really designed to give you kind of a taste of the topic and how you can start to delve more deeply into researching your mariner ancestors. We'll also look at some key records and also repositories for reconstructing your ancestors' life, both on sea and along the shore. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus uh, for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore. You'll find a link to this downloadable PDF in your reminder emails, as well as in your follow-up email that I will send out after today's broadcast. And as I mentioned, we are also recording this event, and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content uh, from today's presentation on our website, as well as our YouTube channel. You can pause pause, rewind, fast forward, uh, take more detailed notes. So if you miss something on today's first listen, not to worry, you will have access to the recording after today. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Susan. Thank you, Ginevra. Welcome everyone to Out to Sea, Researching Mariner Ancestors in New England. As Ginevra said, I'm Susan Donnelly, genealogist with the Newbury Street Press at NEHGS. Take a moment to think about how many nautical images you see each day, whether it's in your own home, the home of a family member, a restaurant, library, or hotel. The images could be a painting like this, a small watercolor of a dock, or a photograph of a family member in a Navy uniform, for instance. These images are everywhere, so much so that we probably don't notice them all the time. I know I definitely don't. Unless you are a lover of such art, you might view this as another maritime image you've seen a hundred times. And the reason I'm mentioning this is to show how much mariner and maritime activity is a part of our day-to-day -day backdrop. <clears throat> you do not have to be in a coastal town to be imbued with these images. Kansas has them too. Until the 20th century, nearly every immigrant to the US came by boat. The sea has a significant impact on the identities of our past and present. 
as Ginevra noted in her description of this webinar, through the centuries, we are all inextricably connected to the sea. Especially before the end of the 19th century, when photography was no longer a professional or wealthy person's game, society depended upon marine artists to illustrate all forms of sea activity. Often seen are paintings of ports like this image because ports were busy and often ships would be anchored for a period of time, long enough for the artist to render the scene as he saw it. What you are looking at is an image of a 19th century oil on canvas painting by Gloucester marine artist Fitzhenry Lane. The scene is the port of Boston Harbor from the vantage point of East Boston. So here you see single masted sloops, fishing boats, and large ships that fall under the umbrella of square riggers, which means the sail presentation is in the shape of a square. And many different types of ocean going vessels were square rigged, such as clipper ships and frigates like the USS Constitution. And this painting is an excellent representation of part of what we are trying to accomplish with this webinar in that every craft in view here has a different purpose and yet all are moving into a bustling and crowded Boston Harbor at the same time to operate business. And given the color of the skyline, it's clear such operations dominated any hour of the day. If you find yourself stuck or have hit numerous brick walls in your Mariner ancestry, ancestry research, do not be discouraged because maritime history is vast. The first sea crossing by humans occurred about 60,000 years ago, and ocean navigation was the only mode of intercontinental travel and trade until the 20th century at the introduction of flight. Today it remains a widely used method for worldwide movement of cargo, military engagement, leisure, and recreation. And that spectrum is robust. Luckily for this webinar, however, we are unpacking some localized maritime research for the New England states, and therefore we will cover the period between the colonial settlements and the 20th century. One of the challenges we face when researching Mariner ancestors is many of the records are not kept under the watch of, of state or local governance the way vital records are. At both the federal and local level, vital records are official and legal documents housed in a state building or courthouse. Several Mariner military records are organized this way, but if we're looking to find our ancestors who worked in other industries, where do we find them? As I said, maritime history is vast, and to bring this webinar to you, we had to isolate general and well-sought sources of profession and it is impossible to cover all of it, even in a lifetime, let alone an hour. So because there's so much material, we're presenting here a general overview of local Mariner ancestry research with detailed historical context. And many of the tools I provide can help you search for Mariners not covered in great detail today. When we say New England, we are referring to the states with a coastline, which are Maine, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Vermont is not included here because it doesn't have a seacoast. Although Lake Champlain certainly saw a great deal of water going activity, in the future perhaps we can organize a webinar specific to smaller waterways, but for now we are on the coast. And today's objective is to provide a general perspective of port towns, their significant industries, and tips to help streamline and assemble the myriad options in mariner research and where to track down relevant records. <clears throat> So what is a mariner? A mariner is a person who navigates or assists in navigating a ship, also called a seaman or sailor. Maritime history is the human interaction with the sea and includes fishing, whaling, naval history, ship design, ship building, maritime trade, etc. But mariner is a very broad term. One could be a mariner who was a merchant and ship owner who either was master of his own ship or who contracted his ship out to other mariners for their business. A mariner can also be a captain of a whale ship in charge of a crew on a whale hunting mission. Oftentimes mariner is a general label and an umbrella under which many kinds of occupations can fall. No matter what your pursuit is in researching mariner ancestors, at any given time period in New England, a basic overview of the seascape 
in the coastal towns representing specific industry and vice versa could assist you with finding more about the mariners you are searching for. So here's a tip. Our ancestors lived where they worked. If a mariner were engaged in the military, depending on the time period, depending on the branch or sub-branch, they might have to muster on a moment's notice. And if they didn't live on the ship, they wouldn't be driving, walking, or taking a coach from several miles away or farther. So if you know where your ancestor lived, then knowing the industries to accompany that area will be helpful to finding their occupation. Conversely, if you know the industry or have a general idea of their industry, then that information would likely help you find out where your ancestor lived. A recommended first step in the process of finding your mariner ancestors would be to have basic or comprehensive knowledge of your port towns and what industries are associated with them. How much you want to learn is up to you. The more you know, the easier your research will be, however. We often say you need to cast a wide net, and here the pun is intended and unintended. Um, paint a broad picture and then boil it down to specifics. Um, a port town is one that is on the sea or harbor where boats and ships go to unload passengers or cargo. There are thousands of miles of tied coastlines in New England. This number takes into account the islands under the jurisdiction of each state, uh, such as Martha's Vineyard or Block Island. So having familiarity with port towns is essential, so keep a map handy or be ready to call one up. Also knowing the general significance of each town is helpful. For instance, the Maine economy incorporated fishing and ship building into many towns, but Maine is probably best known for lobster fishing. New Bedford also had ship building, yet was the whaling capital of the world at one time, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But when you have a decent understanding of where to look, then you might find greater success with narrowing in on an industry and being able to find an ancestor if you are stuck. So these are some of the major ports with uh, their most significant industries. And I apologize in advance if your port of interest is not on these lists. As I mentioned before, this subject is vast, yet we should be able to direct you to some relevant resources to your town or industry of interest. So New London, Connecticut once had a significant whaling industry, and it is also home to the United States Coast Guard Academy. Mystic has an impressive ship building history Starting in 1784, the seaport built over 600 ships. Newport has a naval station dating to the 19th century and also had other maritime activity like fishing. And Warren, Rhode Island was uh, whaling as early as the 18th century. Um, New Hampshire has the smallest amount of coastline in New England and the Portsmouth Navy shipyard was established in the year 1800. So the shipyard has the biggest and most long-standing maritime presence in the state, though New Hampshire did engage in other industries early on where some smaller operations remain, particularly fishing. Um, Maine was not a state until 1820. Its maritime presence before that will fall under the governance of Massachusetts. The state is mainly a fishing economy, though they have others Bath Ironworks on the Kennebec River is a major shipbuilder in the United States and has been around for almost 140 years. Massachusetts is somewhat the center here because it was the first New England colony, but also Boston became the main port of entry in New England. And this means that most transcontinental, I'm sorry, transatlantic or intercontinental ships coming to New England once the colonies were settled would pull into Boston Harbor and usually other states looking to do business in, within New England would go through the port of Boston. There were merchants setting up quickly and therefore trade could ensue while ships were being built to perpetuate that trade. Salem has a historic merchant presence and there are still several houses standing once owned by merchants there today, such as the 18th century Richard Derby House. He was a wealthy and well-known sea captain and merchant. Gloucester is a colonial fishing village um, with currently active commercial fishing for striped bass, winter and summer flounder, mackerel, bluefish, etc. cetera. If, if there is a fishing capital in Massachusetts, it's Gloucester. It was also the first fishing village in Massachusetts settled in 1623. 
and Nantucket and New Bedford still fight over who is the boss of the whaling industry. So let's go over details of some New England industries. This is a codfish. It is in part the abundance of this fish on the coast of New England that serves as the impetus for why these territories were settled by British colonists. A member of parliament once claimed that the codfish was British gold. It made a lot of money for the colonies. Colonizing the New World was a business opportunity and began with cod. The colonies also ended because of cod. The revolution was fueled by anger over cod trading and fishing restrictions the British imposed on the colonists. So the cod covers a lot of symbolic ground in New England and with the colonies from start to finish. Um, hopefully, hopefully everyone has a basic understanding of the Mayflower crossing and landing at Plymouth. You might not know that this was the second attempt at colonizing New England. The first was the Popham colony in 1607 on the coast of Maine. It lasted but a year, though the attempt at settlement was meant specifically to capitalize on the abundance of fish. Once Plymouth colony was established in 1620, other colonies followed, the first being a, a fishing colony at Cape Ann on the North shore of Massachusetts that incorporates the towns of Rockport and Gloucester, as I just mentioned. The other present day states were settled soon after and what they all shared was presence on the coast to launch their economies. And all these economies turned into profitable industries in one way or another. Some dominated for certain periods of time, such as Nantucket and whaling, but now it's primarily fishing and scalloping. Um, so the New England maritime industries and occupations I will cover today are fishing, shipbuilding, whaling, some merchant and trade discussion, and the US Coast Guard and Merchant Marine. So, like I said, the first industry in the New England colonies was fishing. The colonists practiced ground fishing, which is the act of catching a fish that swim close to the bottom of the ocean. Other than cod, ground fish include haddock, redfish, and flounders. Fish was the first New England commodity. Colonists depended on fish for food because the soil here is rocky and not suitable for year-round crops. The native taught the colonists, I'm sorry, the natives taught the colonists how to grow corn, but it wasn't enough. At the time of the revolution, 10,000 New Englanders worked as, fish, as fishermen, which accounted for 8% of the male population. Merchants were also shipping dried fish to the Catholic countries of Europe, where the Pope was declaring more meatless feast days. Dried codfish also fed the slave populations in the West Indian sugar plantations. At its peak, nearly 400 schooners delivered salted cod to ports in North America, Newfoundland, and England. Early, early 17th century New England fishermen fished in small boats near the shore, but later in the 1600s, they began to fish offshore in two-masted schooners with, with crews of seven or eight men. The captain would recruit the crew and choose where to fish as he navigated. Most fishermen did not last after the age of 30 as it was demanding work and drowning was quite common. Um, this is Elbridge Gerry of Marblehead before he was manipulating boundaries of electoral constituency. He was born into a wealthy family and followed his father's trade to become a successful New England fish merchant. He was also the ninth governor of Massachusetts and became vice president under James Madison but started his career as a fish merchant. Another major industry in New England uh, represented in every state is shipbuilding. The first ship built in the colonies was for Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop on the Mystic River in Medford. It was a 30 ton single masted ship called the Blessing of the Bay and she was launched in 1631. All of the port economies shared a dependency on ships. Shipbuilding quickly became immensely profitable in New England with its miles of coastline featuring protected harbors and bays with a strong supply of raw materials. The early wooden boats built for shipping and trade gave way to other occupations associated with shipbuilding, such as sailmakers, rope makers, and riggers. Um, blacksmiths and carpenters were needed as well. You might see the occupation shipwright in your research, and this is an outdated term to call a shipbuilder. 
Uh, a famous 19th century shipbuilder was Donald McKay. He had a few shipyards from Newbury Port to East Boston, and he was the builder of the Flying Cloud, which is one of the most famous clipper ships ever built. His home is still in East Boston, but is privately owned, so don't go knocking for a tour. Um, another, another industry is whaling. Um, this was a barbaric occupation and caused many deaths. Whaling entailed a crew aboard a large ship that would leave a harbor and venture into the ocean in search for whales, and the crew would kill the whales with harpoons. The whale ships uh, would be outfitted with triworks, which is a furnace for the purpose of processing the whale blubber into oil. The ships would also have uh, whale boats on board so the crew could launch a smaller boat and get closer to the whale, as seen in this image. As you can imagine, this was violent and dangerous work. I don't think this image is exaggerated except for the stillness of the men inside the boats. For too long, our survival was at the expense of whales. Colonists were engaging in shore whaling until years later when the practice became an ocean-going occupation employing men in the towns of New London, New Bedford, and Nantucket, among others. Before electricity was used with regularity, we needed whale oil as fuel for lamps. So as the population grew and industry expanded, demand for oil was high. Nantucket and New Bedford were among those boasting the largest fleet of whale ships or whalers until a great fire in 1846 destroyed the Nantucket operation completely and it never rebounded. New Bedford became the capital of the whaling industry. And at its peak, New Bedford boasted a fleet of 329 vessels employing 10,000 men. The industry peaked in 1850. Um, towards the end of the 19th century, kerosene, petroleum, and other fossil fuels were used in place of whale oil and the industry plummeted. This gentleman is Absalom Boston, who was born on the island of Nantucket in 1785 to an ex-slave father and a Wampanoag native mother. In 1822, he captained a whale ship and the ship was named Industry. The ship Industry carried an entirely African-American crew. Its voyage was six months and returned with it were 70 barrels of whale oil and the entire crew intact, which is unheard of. He did not lose one man. Very impressive voyage. The New Bedford Whaling Museum is the go-to place for all whaling information from the past. I will take a risk and say whatever exists on whaling, they have it. And they keep working to bring this information to the public. This search portal is a crew list database with six other databases. Three of them are related to American offshore whaling. Their records span the years 1809 to 1927. Continuing is the effort to transcribe crew lists from other ports, including Fall River and Salem, Massachusetts, as well as New London, Connecticut. So this database does not just include those engaged in the New Bedford whaling industry. There are other online collections on this website um, there's a nice guide to help you best locate materials within their database, and they also have a research library. So <clears throat> this is an example of what will return when you search the crew list database. I queried my own name um, and was surprised to see how many Don links popped up. You'll see the full name is included. Um, the, um, the name and type of vessel the year they went out and what their age was at the time of voyage. On the right side, there is an option to find out more. And when that is accessed, what returns are more details about that crew member. You can see their height and eye color, hair color, skin color. So you might be able to picture in your mind what your ancestor looked like from these lists. And this is a super cool database. Um, another industry would be um, merchants. New, um, a merchant is a person or a company involved in wholesale trade, especially when dealing with foreign countries or supplying merchandise to a particular trade. So we were trading immediately because we had to. The Mayflower was supposed to return to England with goods ready for sale, but instead came back empty 
And this enraged the investors who expected their exploitation of the pilgrims to be immediately profitable. So as the colonies were settling in, investors decided to come here and establish a trade business. Ships kept arriving and they were mostly all merchant ships. This is a favorite of mine, the famous New England merchant, Joseph Peabody. This may seem like low hanging fruit, but um, Joe is a great representation of a person who was involved in several areas of maritime pursuits. He was an officer of privateers in the Revolutionary War. He was the wealthiest man, uh, merchant in Salem at one time with a fleet of 83 ships. Peabody had a massive operation trading tea, white pepper, and opium, among others. Um, in many cases, a merchant would have a naval background or come from a family of merchants. In other words, seafaring would be passed through the generations in perpetuity. It was not unusual for a man to learn seafaring from his father or from a military engagement. When you are researching your uh, merchant ancestors, consider broader, broadening your search to the Navy or other incarnations of the Navy before the revolution and vice versa. <clears throat> Trade businesses materialized in every New England port. Trading would occur locally with other colonies and overseas. A ship would leave port filled with goods for trade and arrive in another, oftentimes would take goods back to the home port. And items traded would be spices, rum, furs, livestock, whiskey, etc. cetera. Um, to find some of your New England merchants, um, there is a website called Maritime History Archive, and it has a great list of New England merchants with biological biographical information, and other details on collections and where they might be found. You'll see this is a Canadian website, but they have a massive expanse of mariner and maritime materials relative to New England states. And remember, we were part of England until 17, 1776. So when hunting for early merchants, look to the Na uh, National Archives UK. They have a collection of merchant and trade records from the 16th century to the end of the 18th century. Some of these records are digitized, most are not. So you'll have to be in contact with them to access their collections. Their lists include account books of the colonies, military commanders, ships logs from America to England and back, details of ports of entry. They also have wills and personal papers of merchants. Um, so I also want to briefly discuss the US Coast Guard and Merchant Marine. Uh, because unlike naval records, these are still mariner occupations and the record keeping is a little scattered. Um, so the U.S. Coast Guard, what is it? Um, it was originally the idea of, uh, or I'm sorry, it was originally the idea was the brainchild of Alexander Hamilton, what well, wasn't, and he had the thought to develop what he called a system of cutters. This was a time when the United States was new, we just shook loose from the crown and we were essentially broke. And not only that, we did not have a US Navy yet. To generate revenue, the US was imposing import tariffs on goods coming into the States, but piracy was rampant and smugglers were bringing goods into US ports to circumnavigate the tariffs. This is an example of a colonial cutter. It's a single masted boat with two four sails. Those would be the sails in the front um, they were built for speed as much as the technology of the time would allow. So a system of cutters were a fleet of sailing sloops under the governance of the U.S. Treasury, and they were dispatched to sea to check on the trade and protect the merchants in U.S. waters to maintain the integrity of the trade system. The crew members and pilots of the revenue cutters were usually fishermen and took the role of both jobs. Originally, the branch was called the Revenue Marine. Then the Department of Treasury created a division of Revenue Marine in 1894, and the service was renamed the Revenue Cutter Service. By that time, we had a US Navy, and the Revenue Marine Division was placed under the command of the Navy during the War of 1812, where the service engaged in more anti-piracy operations. Toward the end of the 19th century, the US Department of Treasury established the Life Saving Service, which is probably what you think of when you consider responsibilities of the Coast Guard. 
It was a concept derived from the act of volunteers launching small boats to assist with shipwreck, shipwrecked mariners. The collection of volunteers that seemed to catch the most attention were those representing the Massachusetts Humane Society. The Humane Society created a life-saving station off the shoreline of Cohasset, Massachusetts. And then that station was the model for other stations that became a system of timber sheds near busy ports and they contain life-saving equipment. As ocean activity increased, the US government realized it needed to intervene to provide better life-saving equipment and training for crews. Stations were added along the coast of Maine, Cape Cod, and other coastal states outside of New England. By 1878, a division of the Department of Treasury was organized and, um, and the US Life Saving Service uh, became official. Then in 1915, the Life Saving Service and the Cutter Service I just described were combined and thus created the US Coast Guard as we know it today. They used 1790, the inception of the Revenue Cutter Service as their birth date. The Coast Guard is under the leadership of the Department of Defense and assists all branches of our military. Their roles are primarily maritime safety, maritime security, and maritime stewardship. And finally, the Merchant Marine. So this is a little tricky because the operation is a blend of private and military service. The Merchant Marine refers to civilian mariners who operate civilian or federal, federally owned merchant vessels. Their essential function is to transport cargo and, and passengers, and they would do this for many different reasons. They are often a supplement to the US Navy, meaning they undertake maritime endeavors during wartime that don't include battle usually. So for instance, in World War II, the Merchant Marine would haul necessary cargo and goods to troops and allies while the Navy was doing other things. Um, they have captains and mates with a crew staffed like any other military vessel and go through training at the Merchant Marine Academy in New York. So what records are available for these professions and where do we find them? For the colonial period, colonial records tend to be a different beast than all others. Under the merchant section earlier, I offered the National, UK, uh, the, the National Archives UK as a source. If you're looking to find out about individuals, this book can be helpful, um, New Englanders in the 1600s by Martin Hollick. This is a finding aid for 17th century New Englanders and it covers source materials for over 3,600 families. What you'll find is an alphabetized list of New Englanders with their approximate vitals and locations, along with the sources cited to find that information. So use the tips from earlier. If you see a location that's a port town, you can investigate the possible mariner occupations for where this individual is listed. The Great Migration Directory is another must have finding aid for the colonial period. This is a directory of individuals all known to have come to New England during the Great Migration period from 1620 to 1640. Each entry provides the name of head of household, their origin if known, date of migration, principal residence, and the best available sources of information for each subject. For records pertaining to the Coast Guard and Merchant Marine, the National Archives houses the most comprehensive records you can find for both. Um, the record collections span the 18th century, uh, from the 18th century to the 20th. They have personnel, payroll, and operations and accounting records. Um, the records also include logs of the Cutter Service. Some of the information contained in these logs um, include vessel name, vessel home port, master's name, accounts of births, deaths, and marriages. So if you're not finding these in, you know, Ancestry or your other vital record sources, look to here. They also include illnesses and um, the engagement or discharge of crew members during voyage, which would undoubtedly include some of those lost at sea, I would imagine. Um, the logs of life-saving stations from 1873 to 1945 are comprised of chronological entries and include information about personnel, patrols, reports of assistance, 
Um, they have a lot more. These are specific to Coast Guard and merchants and merchant mariners, but National Archives is a, is a great source. The US Coast Guard also has a historian's office where they keep documents, including copies, reproductions, and scans of reports, articles, publications, et cetera, detailing the US Coast Guard and its five predecessor agencies. So that would be the Cutter Service and the Life Saving Service, as I mentioned but also Lighthouse Service, the Bureau, Bureau of Navigation, and the Steamboat Inspection Service. The Mystic Seaport Museum has an online collections database for 19th century American merchant marine. Um, it's a digital library of over uh, 120,000 pages of material. Um, this includes ship registers, information on shipbuilding, the China trade, whaling, logbooks, letters to, letters to and from captains. The project centers on merchant vessels of the 19th century, the people who owned them, sailed them, and the records pertaining to them. The online collection also includes a register of seamen's protection certificates, which were printed documents carried by seamen to prove citizenship. It contained birthplace, age, height, skin, eye color, and other distinctive information such as scars or tattoos. And that can be found at mysticseaport.org. This is a screenshot of the register of Siemens protection certificates on mysticseaport.org. This register shows an alphabetical list of the registrants um, and their name, birthplace, and age, among other things. To find mariner ancestors and specific occupations, I would recommend examining all the census records relevant to your search if you have a dependable locale. The US federal census is taken every 10 years. The first was in 1790. It records the heads of household and the number of people living with in every state. And these records are mandated by the US government and stored at the federal level in the National Archives. You can find scanned images on ancestry and family search. But beginning with the 1850 census, the US enumer enumerated professions with their records. So you can search between 1850 and 1940 to find an occupation on the line noting your ancestor. There are also state census records for Massachusetts and Rhode Island that cover this period that also have listed occupations and those are found on ancestry. Here is a screenshot of the 1850 US Census from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And you can see the occupation for James Wood here is fisherman. And George Howes underneath is sailor. So this is evidence reflective of occupations in your port towns. Um, then there is the 1930 U.S. Federal Census Merchant Seamen Schedule that enumerated merchant seamen serving on U.S. flag merchant vessels. The information that can be found on the schedule are name and address of owner or op operator of vessel, um, name of the vessel, the home port, and all five New England seacoast states are represented in the schedule, though not every county or every town in each state. This is an example of the 1930 Merchant Seaman Schedule recorded at Bath, Maine. You can see the name of the vessel and two men enumerated. One is a captain, one is a seaman. Um, these schedules are often sparse, but they are a source of information. You just never know if your ancestor is enumerated if you don't look. Now, an important part of the research is to be able to decode the occupation. The four main occupations that could present some challenges in census research are mariner. Uh, a mariner would be a crew member of a ship, but could also be a captain. Uh, a seaman is usually a naval or ship's crew, sometimes of the merchant marine. Um, a captain is the chief navigator of the ship, sometimes navy. Uh, a mariner master can also be a captain. And a sailor is a fisherman or sometimes ranking or non-ranking crew member of a boat. If you, if you look at like the 1850 or 1860 US census in New Bedford, you're going to see sailor and those would be whalemen. 
Other crew member titles that you might find in your census research would be first mate. A first mate is a deck officer who is second in command in navigation. Second mate is a deck officer, third in command of navigation. The deck officers are responsible for navigating the ship, ranked below the captain, of course. The size of the ship will determine how many deck officers are on it. You'll also see engineer. An engineer is responsible for operating and maintaining the ship's machinery. And depending on the size of the ship, there is usually an engineer crew with the same rank structure as the deck officers. So first engineer, second engineer, et cetera. If you find you're looking through uh, the Newport, Rhode Island census records, for instance, and you're reviewing a list of, of many uh, mariner titles, and you see engineer among them, they're usually going to be the engineer on the ship. And another you might see on census records is the bosun, and the bosun gives orders to non-ranking crew members. You can also find a wealth of information at custom houses. Um, depending on where you need to look, this source can be a jackpot. A custom house oversaw the functions associated with importing and exporting goods into and out of a country, such as collecting customs duty on imported goods. Um, a custom house was typically located in a seaport or in a city on a major river uh, with access to an ocean, and these cities acted as port of entry into a country. So what information is included in custom house records? They'll include records of entrances and clearances of vessels, cargo manifests, books, journals, and logbooks of privateer vessels and passenger lists. The National Archive ha Archives has records from 1745 and then span the years between 1762 and 1982. So I'm guessing between 1745 and the 1760s, they were lost. But those can be found on archive.gov. And also check the custom house in your port of entry if they have archival collections available to the public. I mentioned Mystic Seaport Museum before. Again, um, they also have custom house documents. The collection consists of various custom documents, primarily from ports on the eastern seaboard from the late 1700s until 1866. It contains approximately 300 customs documents of different types, which were required to be carried by the masters of the vessels to prove their cargo was legitimate and that they had paid the necessary duties at the port of entry. And newspapers are another source to locate Mariner info. Newspapers.com, Genealogy Bank, and Newspaper Archive are subscription-based but contain scanned images of hundreds of newspapers. Um, historical societies and libraries will also have newspapers. Just contact one and see what they might have for newspaper collections that you might not find on other sites. This clipping is from the Fall River Monitor from May 20th, 1826. And it shows arrivals and departures at the port of Fall River. Um, it'll show the type of boat, so you can see sloop. The SCHR stands for schooner. And then you'll see the name of the vessel and where, where it sailed from. Um, this is another clipping from the American Telegraph of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, dated April 22nd, 1795. And I found this on newspapers.com. It lists Captain Cobb as captain of the Parthenia. And it arrived from Martinique with, after a slave insurrection in the West Indies. So lots of information can be gleaned from newspapers. And the newspapers representing major ports of call, specifically Boston for New England, usually and usually during the 19th century particularly, the front page will have numerous listings for departures and arrivals of ships, as well as advertisements for crew and passenger recruiting. But I wanted to choose these two examples to represent lesser known options to locate ship names and crew and other information. The Bible of ships is Lloyd's Register. Uh, the Lloyd's Register was an idea founded in a coffee house in London in the 17th century by merchants and men associated with shipping. Lloyd's first register of ships was issued in 1764 and was created in order to give both underwriters and merchants an idea of the condition of the vessels they insured and chartered. 
inside uh, the register, the register includes sections broken down by style of vessels such as schooners and sloops, steam yachts, etc. Here's a page from the schooner section. It's alphabetical by vessel name, and it includes where the ship or boat was built, the owner's name, if different than the captain, and the home port. Where do you find Lloyd's Registers? So archive.org has digitized Lloyd's Registers online from 1776 to 1909. They also have the 1768 register digitized there. Athetrust.org has the 1764 copy digitized. That was the first one. And as well as 1776 through 1925. There are also many copies of bound volumes you can find in bookstores or on eBay if you wanted to own something more commemorative. These two books I highly recommend if you are looking for information on ships. The Early American Ships by John Fitzhugh Millar contains extensive information on North American ships built through the year 1790. An introductory section explains basic features common to all ships of the period, including design, construction, rigs and purposes for which they were built. Um, and Ships of the World, which is a historical encyclopedia, um, each ship is described in vivid short essay and includes physical characteristics, construction, and history from the drawing board to the scrapyard or museum. Meaning, you know, when the idea was the concept in a naval architect and the blueprints prints were being drawn, it will include information on that. And then what happens to the ship after it's used? Does it go to a scrapyard? Is it sunk? Does it go to a museum? It will have that information in there. So that's pretty cool. A cool Rhode Island fact is that Rhode Island waters has more shipwrecks than any other state, over 2000. The National Park Service has a website of state submerged resources. And here's a link to the Rhode Island shipwrecks. That's pretty cool too. The most important type of record for detailed histories and accounts of Mariner ancestors will be found in manuscripts. Um, they can be registers, log books, journals, ship lists, books, diaries, meeting minutes. Those all fall under the umbrella of manuscripts. For this type of research, manuscripts are going to provide a great amount of detail about ships and crews and the activities of both. A manuscript is any unpublished work by anyone. They are usually one of a kind items. Sometimes they're offered in original form, other times transcriptions, and their pages might be scanned or uh, scanned on microfilm or digitized. Manuscripts are defined as items that are created in the course of everyday life. Many records pertaining to an ocean going pursuit are kept in private collections or publicly funded repositories such as local libraries. Um, outside of the previously discussed methods and locations, much of what you will need to investigate in your research for Mariner ancestors will be kept in manuscripts. This is, a, this is an example of a page from a manuscript. These are from the papers of the Charles W. Morgan, which was the name of a whaling bark out of New Bedford. Here you see a ledger of payments to the crew and lists their names the role on their role on the ship and the amount they were paid. So John Jacobs here uh, you know, was a seaman and he was paid $81.70, it looks like. From a different manuscript titled The Letters of Matthew Bunker, which mainly read like a diary, this says, April 30th, the wind freshened a little during the night. And this morning, our partner was about two miles astern. Captain Bowen hailed her during the night, and she proved to be the ship Tartan of Philadelphia from New York to Canton. The captain said he had been out 11 days, which we knew to be false, as our mate said she cleared five days before we left New York. So what did we glean from these few sentences? The ship Tartan was from Philadelphia. She was engaged in the China trade out of New York. We get that from the Canton reference, and that the captain of her ship was not very truthful. So in just a few sentences, you're creating a picture with details that you cannot find in vital record collections. Outside of the familiar online repositories where you might feel you have hit a brick wall, there are other great sources for finding what you need to piece together the stories of your Mariner ancestors. Museums, public and research libraries, 
colleges and universities, historical societies. Many historical societies and libraries have public reading rooms where visitors can access their collections and their collections can include periodicals, images, or journals, for example. It may take some digging, but it's worth investigating this avenue. All colleges have libraries also. Many times, if, a, if, fam, if some family pa papers are left after a person dies, for example, the estate will donate them to a college for research purposes. Sometimes the college of choice is one close to the family or an important part of their community. And the means of delivery is up to the curator. So every repository with a manuscript collection is going to have a different policy on how these collections are presented to you. So they might be glad to hand over an original diary, or they might have a policy where they offer transcriptions of the diary and will scan pages for a fee. I mentioned earlier Mystic Seaport Museum for Merchant Marine Collections. Again, they also have an extensive maritime manuscript collection that includes ships logs and journals diaries and documents from the whaling fishing and shipping industries uh, a digitized manuscript collection is not very common mystic seaport is a well-funded generously staffed institution and they have the manpower to digitize collections for online viewing but many other historical societies in museums do not have the same access to resources and therefore finding a collection completely or even partially digitized is extremely rare. But it's important that we patronize these institutions to keep them going. And exercising patience with their limitations is recommended. Don't let the lack of staffing resources at a repository discourage you from doing the work to access their valuable archives. This process takes some mining, but it can yield rewards immeasurable. Um, for museums, a great museum source is the collections at the Penobscot Marine Museum in Maine. They have digitized logbooks and journals. They also have papers pertaining to specific species of fish, different ships, and some manuscripts and transcriptions from the 16th century. Another one is the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. It has over 2,500 titles of fisheries, history, and genealogy, including vessel logbooks and letters. And these two they're not considered a maritime museum on the Wikipedia list, but clearly they have maritime historical collections. So instead of looking for a general list on the internet, look for your port towns and investigate whether they have a museum or collections repository. The Essex Shipbuilding Museum has manuscript collections from the 18th century onward that depict shipbuilding heritage. These include day books, vessel and labor contracts, et cetera. They also have wills and deeds. The Heart Nautical Collections at the MIT Museum. So this is a college and a museum. Um, collections, they have collections of naval architecture, marine engineering, um, et cetera. They have a 3000 volume library. The Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum has several hundred thousand printed volumes and a linear mile of manuscripts collections. They also have thousands of log books, account books, diaries, et cetera. The library has a research room with an online collections index and digitized database with a growing number of digitized items. These materials date from the 17th to the 20th century and include manuscripts and maritime journals. As new collections are digitized, they add them to their website. And as an exper experiment, I queried just the word captain and over 2000 results appeared in this portal right here. So that's a good resource. In New Hampshire, the Portsmouth Athenaeum has over 100 manuscript collections, including family papers. Um, the Connecticut State Library has an online database of locale and subject specific manuscripts, including two volumes pertaining to trade and maritime affairs from the colonial period. The library also has an awesome um, uh, newspaper collection on microfilm. And colleges and universities, like I said, the University of Maine has a database with digitized historical collections pertaining to the fishing industry. They have boat surveys, dragger permits, information on ships, voyages, ships, papers, and account books. University of Rhode Island boasts 6,000 linear feet of 18th and 19th century records that include oyster beds and fisheries. The University of New Hampshire has a collection of 19th century personal diaries. They also have papers from the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard spanning from 1739 to 1985. Historical societies operate on a state level 
a town level, sometimes a subject level, and a county level in some cases. Each of the five New England states represented in this webinar have a historical society with maritime collections. I noted here Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, New London County, Connecticut has a historical society with newspaper, manuscripts, and scrapbook collections from the 1700s onward. Um, they contain wills, property transactions, ship registers, diaries, correspondence. New London, the town, also has a historical society, but they didn't seem to have collections noted online. So don't forget the hidden gem at the county level. And don't be afraid to look through collections in other states. That, that might first seem like an irrelevant location. It's not uncommon for a state like Connecticut to have collections pertaining to a family from Massachusetts or New York, for example. As I mentioned, family papers and journals could be donated from an estate that has roots elsewhere. An online source to locate manuscripts is Archive Grid. It includes over 7 million records describing archival materials. Um, and it represents over 1,000 archival institutions. Here I just queried the Sloop of War Defense and a collection from Martha's Vineyard Museum and Yale University popped up, but there were 39 record results returned. So what skills do you need to have or techniques should you be aware of before be you begin searching for manuscripts? Read carefully. Also transcribing handwritten materials is essential. Sometimes the handwriting is not legible. A technique we use is going through each letter of a word you can't figure out. The process of elimination can lead you to an answer. And these research methods are not as easy as querying a birth date into ancestry. Um, the methods require more elbow grease, but the rewards can be a gold mine. You could find a list of, of crew members for a ship with your ancestor's name on it. You can find details about a captain's first wife or a child they lost. The, the scenarios are endless. Um, give yourself time to prepare and get organized, chip away at it, review our webinar on using manuscripts in your genealogical research, keep your questions simple. What kind of ship? Where did the ship voyage? And have patience. Once you have a basic understanding of where to find sources for your research, tap into your patience reserves. Not everything is digitized, so you might have to submit a request to find out what collections a repository has on hand, and public libraries, for instance, were understaffed before COVID. So being patient with them is going to help you both. We want to keep these institutions going so we can access their information. And sometimes information can take some time. Just don't give up. So in summary, I recommend looking for port towns, having knowledge of the industries there, investigate what repositories have collections relative to the town or subject, Look for online collections in libraries, universities, and historical societies. Query various nautical terms within their databases, such as mariner, captain, crew, ship, merchant, trade, seafaring, etc., and have patience. To end this webinar, I'm including an image of Motif 1 on Bradley Wharf in Rockport. It is said to be the most often painted building in America. You've probably seen many versions of it. Good luck, everyone. All right. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for your fantastic presentation. Before we get to your questions, I'm excited to announce just some several upcoming programs. If you like today's program and have Massachusetts ancestry, I suggest you consider registering for our four-week online course that begins on May 5th and led by experts here at American Ancestors. Each class provides a century-by-century -century look at the records, resources, repositories, and research strategies that are essential to exploring your Massachusetts roots. Then on May 25th, we bring you author Skip Finley with his book, Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy, as part of our American Inspiration best-selling author series. You can register for these two programs and all of our upcoming events at AmericanAncestors.org slash education slash online hyphen classes. And I will be including this link in my follow-up email after today's live broadcast. All right, so um, let's get to some questions. And uh, I know a lot have come in, a lot have come in by email. Some are very specific. Specific. Um, just 
you know, based on the amount of time that we have, um, I do recommend if you have more specific questions or we don't get to them today, you can certainly reach out to um, our genealogists using our chat service, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but you can see the link um, to that service on the uh, on your screen now. All right, so Susan, um, we have of several questions about uh, ancestors who are lost at sea. So how would you find out um, more about an ancestor who was quote unquote lost at sea? So it's going to depend on the industry. So if you know uh, they were in the whaling industry, New Bedford Whaling, as I showed earlier, has crew lists and they would have kept log books containing the names of any crew members who did not return. Um, if they were in the merchant marine, go specifically to the records of the National Archives, as I mentioned, uh, like the logs of the Cutter Service and Coast Guard. Um, outside of that, try newspapers. Headlines reporting shipwrecks or tragedies at sea were very common and often made uh, big news. If this were a general or non-occupational loss, like a civilian sea crossing, I would look at the passenger manifests on ancestry and American ancestors. Sometimes cemetery markers also include specific information on uh, loss at sea, so check find a grave also. All right, thank you. Um, and I see uh, several questions about privateers as well. That's not something that we necessarily focused on in today's session, but mm -hmm. um, are there any records to learn more about kind of the vessels that were engaged in privateering and their mm -hmm. hired crew? So for the colonial wars, the National Archives has collections that include judicial records, military service records, and prisoner records. The archives also has a War Department collection that has records from 1709 to 1915. The unfortunate reality is most records in War Department custody were destroyed by fire in 1800. Many of the remaining Revolutionary War records were lost during the War of 1812. So whatever is left for official records, they would be kept at National Archives. Um, the Sun, the uh, Massachusetts Society of Sons of the American Revolution has some decent information on war privateers on um, their website. You just, you won't find one repository where all these records are kept. They're going to be scattered based on nothing but whoever has the room to collect and curate them. I mentioned bef colleges before, I found the University, University of Michigan has three volumes of privateers records from the 18th century. And um, so your best bet might be to try find information on the vessel if you have the name, the battle or the location. Um, if you don't know that information, you have to start somewhere. So I would recommend you know, picking a locale and then going through what's available for collections related to that subject. All right. Um, now, we also had a question, and I'm sure this is relevant to a lot of folks listening. You know, if you know that your ancestor was a mariner, but you don't know much else, so you don't know um, maybe what ship they may have been on, how do you learn um, what ships they may have served on? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to cast out a wide net. Like I said, this takes a lot of research and then kind of boiling down to specifics. Um, knowing the type of ship that would accompany the industry. For instance, for instance, you know, if you had a mariner uh, ancestor who was on a whale ship, they're not going to be on a schooner. A schooner is a small boat that, you know, is used for fishing, racing sometimes. They're going to be on a larger ship like a bark or a brig. Um, and those, that information can be found in Lloyd's really um so you would really have to kind of do a little bit of mining look for the ships look for the ship's owner what the port of call was but having some knowledge of the ships and what industries accompanied them would be wise Ginevra and i talked earlier about maybe doing a, a ships and shipwreck um, webinar to to help you find those answers more easily um, let's see, a few other questions. Um, we had a question about um, learning more information about merchant slave ships. How do you go about that type of research? 
So the Library of Congress has the slave narratives as well as ancestry does. Um, records of the United States Custom Service at the National Archives should have passenger lists and cargo on merchant ships. This should include the number of slaves and from where the boat sailed. Um, the National Archives also has records of the government of the Virgin Islands and included are some slave lists and lists of free persons of color. So I would go to the nationalarchives.gov and see what they have that might be specific to um, merchant slave ships. Okay, um, and then we had a few questions about kind of other occupations that might you might find on the US Census you know, uh, rigger, cocker, you could find, you know, the ship's cook, you know, other other mm -hmm. occupations. Um, how can you kind of learn more about those, you know, those occupations and how they might relate to uh, what we've been discussing? Mm. Um, you know, a dictionary is helpful. Um, and not to be not to be flipped, it's really true. Um, a rigger is a person who installs the system of ropes and cables and chains that support the ship or boat's masts. Um, the job of a caulker is to make the hulls and decks tight and leak free. They also restore older hulls after an extended voyage so they can perform as required uh, for the next voyage. They do this by using a material called oakum, which is usually tarred hemp fiber and they seal the joints by hammering the oakum into the planking and then um, using a special hot iron. But um, a dictionary is helpful for that. But also um, there are ways that you can locate, I think if you even go on like census.gov, there's some PDFs in, uh, on the websites that you can see how they define some of the occupations. So that would be a good place to look also. All right, maybe just one final question before we uh, wrap up for the day. Um, there were a few questions about piracy and mm -hmm. pirate attacks and how you can find out more about that. Piracy, so people have written books about pirate attacks. Um, the National Archives will, ha or the U.S. Navy would have records on merchant si ship seizures usually, but I don't think there is one source to find them. I think there are a lot of places you can look. I know there's a book on the complete history of piracy. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the name, <clears throat> and you know, querying that into a search engine will probably help you. Um, I found a link actually too that complies with, uh, or that compiles a lot of books. Um, and it's called Colonies, Ships, and Pirates. And the web address is csphistorical.com. So it would stand for Colonies, Ships, and Pirates, historical.com. But most of those attacks are written by books. There are a lot of uh, enthusiasts for this type of thing. And um, that would be the best source. Cast a wide net. All right. Well. Those are apt words, cast a, cast a wide net. Um, so with that, um, I know we, like I said, we didn't get to everyone's question. Um, if you do have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider hiring our research services team or using our expanded chat service. So that chat service puts you in direct communication with a genealogist. It's free and open to the public Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time, and it can be accessed at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. And I will be including all of this information as well as a link to the recording and to the syllabus that you can purchase um, in my follow-up email to you later today. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and for others. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about up coming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.